Hello and welcome to this special. May 25th, 2022 marks the 55th anniversary of an event, an uprising in a small corner of Northeast West Bengal that spawned a movement. Naxalbari, where it happened over time, became synonymous with an armed rebellion that at one time posed the biggest risk to India's internal security. The violence has festered on, but between 2004 and 2008, it was pretty much at its peak, gripping as many as 200 districts along the length of India, an area that came to be known as the Red Corridor. It was at this time that uh, author and journalist Sudeep Chakravarti traveled to the deep interiors, the worst affected areas, to write his book, The Red Sun. So as we mark uh, the making of modern India, our series, and as we uh, you know, uh, go closer to the 15th of August, which is a kind of a culmination, is a mark uh, really that we are looking towards, let's try and understand the genesis of this movement, how it kind of became viral, so to say, and what are the ramifications of that? Sudeep, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Sudeep, uh, you know, uh, as I said, a small incident sparked off and became a movement, but it wasn't the first time that there was a problem because uh, in uh, 1945 to about 52, there was a festering issue in uh, Telangana, for instance, in Barangal, in Nalgonda, again, a peasant uprising. The circumstances were very different, but it was an issue that was obviously a legacy issue that had continued. But what made Naxalbari become such a pivot? Thank you for asking that question, Mini, because uh, and there was a legacy issue, not just in Andhra Pradesh and the sort of the, the agency area uh, along the coast, but there was also a legacy issue in West Bengal or, or in Bengal, uh, because when it started in the 1940s, uh, in there was still sort of Akhand Bharat, as, our, uh, as people like to call it today. And you had the Tebhaga movement uh, in the 1940s in Bengal, which was not the same as what was there in the Andhra region, but Tebaga, and the reason I must mention this, Nini, is because this sort of evolved into the Naxalbari movement in many, many ways, or what is called the Naxalbari movement, because Tebaga was about one third, it, it was about sharecropping, uh, it was about uh, the, you know, how much the tillers of the land would get in return, and how much the landholders or the landlords would receive, and there was this Tebaga movement, which sort of literally went viral in, in the Bengal Delta region and also in northern central and northern Bengal. And it got it was very violent to the extent that the Communist Party of India at that time uh, and many members of the Communist Party of India got into that movement. You had intellectuals, you had brilliant uh, people, including my own father-in-law, uh, Mini, who uh, left, uh, you know, sort of a brown sahib to the Ennet and uh, a, a product of St. Xavier's College in Calcutta, not Kolkata, Calcutta, because the brown signs wouldn't say Calcutta. And then he was in Burma Shell and so on and so forth. And his father was a barrister, you know, trained in UK. And these were the people who you know, took arms and took ideology and took their passion and went into the Tebhaga movement. And uh, that is when the Communist Party of India was banned uh, and so on and so forth, even after India's independence, but they stayed with it. Then it petered down and then uh, but the inequity never went away. And it kept resurfacing. And here we sort of segue to Naxalbari, if you will, uh, cut to chase from 19, uh, the 1940s and early 50s. Then CPI, Communist Party of India, splits into the Communist Party of India Marxist, uh, which becomes a sort of a sort of a liberal bloc within the communist movement. So it, it takes a life of its own. Uh, the communist movement becomes a more politically accepted movement because it becomes part of India's democracy, the, in the new Indian Republic, so on and so forth. It keeps going on. The, the radical left seemingly is co-opted into the political super superstructure of new India. Uh, so this is all in the surface, but below the surface, the inequities never went away, whether in Andhra, uh, whether in the agency areas, whether in Bihar, whether in Bengal, uh, you, you name it, Central India, in the, in the tribal areas. So when you come to 1967, 25th of May, 1967, which is, and 26th when the, the reaction happened, and then it went viral, uh, then as now, uh, when that happened, it actually is based on uh, 
this explosive nature is based very much on this undercurrent, which never went away. So what happened in Nasrbari is actually pretty much a, a, a redux of what happened in the Tebaga movement in many, many ways, where there were uh, farmers who wanted to clarify their hold on the land, more important, the returns they would receive on their land. Uh, they protested against the landlords, the landlords uh, hit back, farmers took to the, literally to the bylanes and streets of uh, Darjeeling district, which is where it happened, Naxalbari is a small village. And, uh, and then uh, the police came and got back on the villages, the village, villages retaliated, police uh, attacked the villagers and you had your Naxalbari martyrs. And then the, uh, the, the, the sort of, within the Communist Party of India Marxists, there was a, they began to develop a extreme faction, an ultra left faction within the sort of left uh, as, as it had developed. And that faction, which ultimately was led by breakaways like terrorists like Charu Mazumdar, who actually led the Naxal, one of the leaders of the so called Naxalbari movement, uh, this faction uh, took on the cause, if you will, of the farmer, of Naxalbari. And, Northern Bengal, and then gave it political fuel, political fire to that aspiration and coalesced it. So that's how it came to be called the Naxalbari movement. The, the, right. the, the, there was no Maoist at that time. They didn't call themselves Maoists. They didn't call themselves Naxals. They didn't call it the Naxalbari movement. They were communists. And, and okay, they, they were Maoists to some extent, but they, they were really radical communists. That's how they saw themselves. And it's over time, yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's interesting because, you know, uh, it, it almost, it, when you look back and you have, uh, you know, the, the rear view mirror through which you can see it, it's almost as there was uh, the, the ingredients of a perfect storm, you see, because uh, these peasant movements were rising from Vietnam on, there were lots yes. of uh, uprisings. The 60s yes. were a terrible decade for India. It was a decade wrought with problems, right? Yes. And then you had this issue and surprisingly, it was the Ajoy Mukherjee government, a united um, the front government with, uh, with communist parties in power who had come, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in February 1967. And this happens in May 1967. So it's ironic, isn't it? I mean, of course, there is this larger piece, there's this whipping up of, of anger that is happening, but it also happens uh, when your government, so to say, is in power. It, have you, I mean, what, how do you reconcile that? Well, there was a break of... There's no reconciling it, Mini, because you know there were many streams at play simultaneously. As you said, the, it was like it was ripe for a perfect storm. There was always ingredients for the storm. There was stormy weather. It was just that storm system hadn't become visible to what I would call uh, middle India. The storm system was always visible to uh, lower middle India or, or you know below the below the horizon or beyond the horizon India. They always knew. That there was inequity and there was always cause for a perfect storm. It's it's essentially it came together because yes, the uh, the, the the difference in in this case was that uh, the 60s, the late 60s, mid to late 60s, because of the Vietnam uh, War and similar left movements that had sort of run, sort of spiraled across the world at that time, more or less. America, it was it was the hippie movement had come on. The flower children were doing what they were doing. Europe had gone left liberal. It, it was all across the world, uh, and the, the ideologues, the, the, the bright intellectuals, the, the brightest of Indian uh, colleges and universities, it took many of them took to this movement, and they said that we, we are uh, for the cause. Uh, the cause was not Maoism or communism. The cause was they didn't they didn't profess that cause. They professed the cause of the farmers of India. They professed the cause of the lower caste. Of India, they profess the cause of the tribal people of India who are being done to death, literally done to death, by uh, non-governance and misgovernance. So they went with that, and they coalesced. They helped their ideology, this intellectual cream, if you will, this intellectual lair, helped to coalesce that rebellion right. from what would have been a farmers' rebellion, which may or may not have gone ahead in a sort of a uh, in, in an organized manner. It may have remained. Uh, sort of a very localized situation, but it, 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 the fire spread and there were people there ready to organize these separate fires 
into a larger configuration. That's what happened. Right. Charuk Mazumdar stands out as a larger than life figure uh, in this uh, rebellion. He goes on to write his eight documents, you know, the, the, the essays on, on, uh, on um, the movement which inspires others. And you keep, make reference to this numerous times in your own travels as you meet the Kader, so to say. Uh, what is the legacy of the man, you think? The legacy of the man is that the uh, I, I think just sort of, uh, I mean, he was an ext he was extremist to the core. I mean, he, he was ultra radical, even for the extremist left. He was, he was actually, many people, ironically, found him too radical and too extreme. So even colleagues of his, like, you know, Kanu Stanyal, who I met and spoke with, and I'm happy to talk to him about it, because he actually gave me the mantra about how to recruit a rebel. Uh, for instance, we can talk about that a little later. But he was too extreme for people like Kanu Sanyal and even academicians from that time who are left liberal to this day, like Dilip Simeon, uh, who is a very well-known academician in Delhi. And he makes no bones about being part of the Naxal movement when he was a young man. But he, I mean, he is actually called, he's, he's spoken to me of Charu Mazamdar being a psychopath because he took it to the complete extreme. In the sense, I'm, I'm coming to that because Charu Mazumdar's legacy was to, uh, with his fiery writing, fiery speech making, uh, positioning himself um, within the left as radical left, and then breaking away to form the Communist Party of India, Marxist Leninist, breaking away formally, sure. and expelled actually from the Communist Party of India, Marx, and then forming his own, uh, own, own group, allying with people in Orissa, allying with people in Andhra Pradesh, allying with people in Delhi, Punjab was a huge hotspot for the Naxal movement in the 60s and 70s, which we don't realize because there was an agrarian issue there in, in, in Punjab uh, then as now. So he gave that voice and through the, the magazines like Liberation, which became cult magazines, became fashionable ultra-left magazines for people to read. He gave that voice. But he also, his legacy, many unfortunately, is also that he went so far to the extreme. And that is one of the reasons why the Naxal movement of the 60s and 70s tapered away and was easy for the government to go against it is because they adopted a policy of annihilation. Kanu Sanyal uh, advocated the destruction and complete annihilation of what he called the class enemy. Now that for him was anybody who represented the state, including the police constable. Right. In, not just the chief minister or the minister or the prime minister or the, the director general of police or the or the daroga or the commissioner of police, but the constable, uh, the bus driver, uh, the beat policeman, the rural policeman. It, you know, it, after a point, Naxals of a certain caliber were going about literally indiscriminately killing uh, what they saw as the class enemy. It went out of control for even many people within that, the rebel movement of that time. It, that is also his legacy. So while he presents this, this undeniable um, ideological platform, he is in many, in fact, if you go to many of these areas, you will see a series of portraits to this day, where you have Marx, you have Lenin, you have Stalin in an unfortunate case, you have Mao and you have Charu Mazumdar as a pantheon of Naxalism or, 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 or the Maoist rebellion to this day. But his legacy is also extremely violent and uh, also psychopathic to a great extent. I can't... Yeah, and, and the violence, I mean, the violence that this movement has, uh, has resulted in is just unbelievable. I mean, the number of deaths. But, you know, I am going to ask you one question and, and quote uh, 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 one of the uh, people from your book who, who said that Naxalbari uh, was an isolated incident which got corrected within months, but it hyper jumped into several areas. And I think that that's a wonderful way of putting it because that's exactly what happened both in Telangana actually and in Naxalbari, where while the, the event itself was controlled, the impact of that event was felt um, multi -time, multiple times over and in a much larger canvas. So why do you think that happens? Because, it, because of that tender, meaning that is because of the undercurrent that, that existed across India. Because it couldn't hyper jump unless, you know, what the, rebe the rebels call the objective con conditions for rebellion, the objective conditions for revolt need to be there. Like if you speak to a textbook Maoist, for instance, or a textbook rebel, they will tell you that, you know, they will quote Mao. 
uh, textbook model, objective conditions were not there, uh, so on and so forth. So objective conditions existed, which is why the Naxalbari uh, incident, and even if it was brought under relative control in Naxalbari, but only for a while, because it, again, the fire was, you know, it raged for years in the Naxalbari area in Northern Bengal, it kept moving further to the South. It hyperjumped to Bihar. And that time Bihar included present day Jharkhand as well. Uh, it hyperjumped to Madhya Pradesh. It hyperjumped to uh, Andhra and what is also today's Telangana. It, it hyperjumped to Orissa. It hyperjumped to Punjab, which is one of the key, which was one of the key geographies of, for the Naxal movement of the 60s and 70s. Right. Uh, and so there were reasons for it, mainly because there was inequity in the farm areas, there was uh, misgovernance, there was non-governance in many, many areas. There was complete absence of the delivery of the criminal justice system. There was no recourse for the farmers or the lower caste or the peasantry or the downtrodden, to, to use a cliche term, to seek recourse to the justice that you and I or our forebears in the cities of India could 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 claim recourse to by simply by being near uh, vehicles which would give us the justice. You and I take justice for granted, but it, it has been denied to hundreds of millions of our fellow citizens for the last 55 years or more. Right, and you're full of full of stories of, of the of the pain that that uh, that was felt over here. Then you know when you pull out the map of, of the Red Corridor, you'll see that uh, it's a strip uh, across the old tribal districts, the Gorn districts, the the um, uh, you know uh, the where the natural fault lines have been there for a long time because this was a place of the Sankhil Rebellion, even in the uh, pre-independence British era. This was a place where tribals and people had been denied their rights and that had persisted and continued and we've done stories on that on Levy Street. But let me come back uh, uh, on back onto the chronology of it. You know, when you write, uh, wrote this book, I think you traveled around 2005, 6, 7. At that time, um, this was a, uh, yes, and 8, and 8 was when you published it. This was a time when the movement was at its height uh, and Manmohan Singh had famously said that this is you know the biggest risk to internal security uh, what happened because you know there, there's a uh, there is a heightened tension around 2000 and when we now look at history with the rearview mirror you understand that the, after the first wave of liberalization and uh, while the cities of India were growing the inequity would have been even more stark so what what do you think led to this uh, you know this flaring up around the 2000 to 2005 period. Okay, so there is a there is a mechanics to it all. One is the the underlying reasons, and one is the mechanics of how the the rebellion itself evolved through coalitions and other things. We'll I just quickly sort of paint it with a brush. Now uh, the red corridor is actually uh, it should be attributed to the the master of the modern day Jumla, and our current leaders have learned well from that, Mr. L.K. Advani. In fact, he coined this phrase uh, from Tirupati to Pashupati, which is basically the red corridor and Pashupati because that's in Nepal, uh, the temple complex uh, at the outskirts of Kathmandu. And actually, uh, in uh, there was a raging rebellion, Maoist rebellion in Nepal at that time, which ran uh, from 1996 to, to 2006, it, it, and which led to the toppling of the monarchy in Nepal. So you had so you had that corridor because it, it sort of went cut across from Northwest uh, Andhra, Telangana, and then carried through to Orissa, present day Jharkhand, Bengal, Bihar, and then onto the Terai region of Nepal. And then, which was basically central, East Central Nepal, and Ergo Kathmandu, which is the center of the past. So therefore, Tirupati to Pashupati was the thing. And basically what happened is that, you know, you had these, uh, and it was no longer, maybe this is a good time to also clarify, I mean, that people call it the Naxalites and call it the call them Naxalis and so on and so forth. But the the uh, the Maoist rebellion, which we see from 2000 onwards, there was nothing. I mean, the Naxal Naxal Bari movement is long dead. Uh, then this is really the present-day Maoist rebellion. Which were it, there was no Naxali. They don't call themselves Naxali. They call themselves Maoists or communists. 
So what you had is that these, uh, and, and this speaks to the misgovernance and the non-governance uh, of our country, alas, because in, uh, and I actually saw Manmohan Singh, the finance minister, I've interviewed Manmohan Singh, the finance minister in 1991. And then when he became prime minister, I saw that evolution as well. And I, I've seen that growth which we just talked about. And I've also seen, therefore, as a business journalist before I became any other kind of journalist, I've seen the mall stupor of India, where there was a great disconnect when there was this gold rush uh, happening for uh, courtesy of India's liberalization process. And you and I are direct beneficiaries of it. There was equally this completely disconnected other India, which we forgot existed, where these inequities that have existed from in the, the time of independence and before, and definitely since 25th of May 1967. So that objective condition for continued rebellion and revolt never went away. So there was always misgovernance, there was always non-governance, and there was always lack of the criminal justice system, but it was as if it was hidden away from this, this India that was middle India that was running and justifiably so headlong into unprecedented opportunity and economic growth and, and growth of income and opportunity and consumerism. And so be it. Why not? But you can't. The, the reason why it continued, the rebellion continued to grow is this India, policymaking India and this mall India, if you will, completely ignored that you cannot move ahead if 75 to 80 percent of your country is not invited to the good news party. So there was this basic disconnect. And what happened is, that, so this was the objective condition that continued to, sure. even though things happened very well for hundreds of millions of us as well. But, and then one crucial thing happened that you had this splintered group of uh, extreme left-wing groups that were in Bihar and Bengal, in present day Jharkhand, in Andhra, for instance, in the Andhra area, you had what is called the Communist Party of Mar Communist Party of India, Marxist-Leninist People's War. So, which is often erroneously called People's War Group. It was not PW Group G or Group. They were just called the faction was called People's War. It just came to be called PWG. So, what happened is that this Andhra faction, which was a very large and influential faction, and actually led the ingress from Andhra Pradesh into present-day Chhattisgarh uh, in, in, in the 90s. That's when they set the stage for uh, what is today Dandakaranya region, which is the hub, remains the hub of the Maoist rebellion. It began then. Then there was a, another key faction which operated in uh, sort of Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and Jharkhand, called the Maoist Coordination Committee, Maoist Communist Center, MCCI, Maoist uh, Co coordination committee in the Maoist Communist Center of India. They coalesced, and in 2004, many this northern faction, if you will, MCCI and CPI MLPW People's War, the faction in Andhra, they formed. They came together to form the Communist Party of India Maoist CPI Maoist, which continues today to be the the preeminent conglomerate, the Maoist rebel conglomerate in India. So when that happened, when they pool their resources, their networking and their leadership. So the number one leader came from PW. The number two leader came from MCCI and so on and it so forth. It went so, national, so to say, with that coming together. Yeah. And it's it, it, ironic it happened in 2004 because that is the year that the BJP for its re-election came up with its India shining. And everybody knew there was a disconnect. But at a time when this was at the height, I mean, talking yeah. about India shining, it was really egg in the face. And that's exactly what happened. Very quickly, this also determines what happens next, Sudeep. Because yeah. with the UPA coming in, in power, they quickly set up the National Advisory Council, which is later criticized for being overly left-wing socialist. But it was a logical thing to do at this point, wasn't it? It was a completely logical thing to do. And I'm very glad they did it because the benefits that have accrued from that uh, in many ways. And I'll explain very, very quickly. Now, here, one it must be said that the UPA government that came in was also um, led this sort of fight back uh, against the Maoist rebellion in, in a very extreme manner. And people associate the BJP or the NDA governments with heavy handedness. But as far as the Maoist rebellion was concerned, the UPA government literally led the way. So uh, for instance, and that also complicated matters because you had huge human rights 
violations when there were collateral damage where tribal people and non-combatants got caught in the middle of this war between the state and 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 uh, the Maoist rebels, and and that led to its own series of complications. But we'll we'll come to that a little later, perhaps. But what, what happened is that the UPA government did a twofold approach. One is that they began to coordinate. So here, actually, 2004, 5, 6, with the advent of the UPA government, many things began to happen, which continue to this day. Uh, one is police reforms began to happen. The second thing that very quickly happened is that the Maoist rebels totally exposed the lack of preparedness of the police forces of several states of India, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, Bengal, Jharkhand, uh, Andhra Pradesh to a great extent. This was the time that specialized and so-called anti-Naxal forces being developed. The Greyhound force in Andhra Pradesh being the first such specialized force, right? Then there be, these were the time, this is the time when it all began to sort of be replicated across other states. So then Greyhound force began to export its know-how to other states of India. Then uh, there was, as you know, these are very, very important things that happened, many, and not just for the rebellion, but for policing at large. So I think we must mention this, uh, that, as you know, law and order is a state subject in India. So there's always been the lack of coordination between the Ministry of Home Affairs and various state units of police forces. But the Maoist rebellion, Actually, uh, this time, the, UP, the first UPA government onwards and then right up to the second UPA government ran up till May 2014, what began to happen was to combat the Maoist threat, there had to be, there was much greater coordination between New Delhi, if you will, the central government and the state governments where you had the Maoist rebellion happening. So then the police of these states began to cooperate with each other. Earlier, say rebels ran away from Andhra Pradesh to Orissa, then the Andhra Pradesh police force had no jurisdiction. But yeah. then this cross-state cooperation began to happen, which exists to this day. Uh, so you had this happening. On the other hand, you had this sort of coordination and so on and so forth led to a grotesque situation of immense human rights violation, ironically, with a Congress-led government in New Delhi and a BJP-led government in Chhattisgarh. I'm specifically talking about Salwa Judum, which was a vigilante movement, which was created by in Chhattisgarh with the full blessing of the UPA government in New Delhi, a BGP government in Chhattisgarh, blessed by the UPA government in New Delhi, unleashed Salwa Judum, which was a vigilante movement which born, uh, recruited from the tribal people of Chhattisgarh and that area in order to fight back the tribal support that the Maoist government had. Uh, it, in it was disbanded with Supreme Court intervention because it was so bad. No, that I mean, we'll come to that very quickly. Uh, it, it, the Supreme Court stepped in in 2011 yes. to ensure that the Salva Judum was dis disbanded, officially disbanded, which is, a, I think, a great victory for democracy. Uh, but th this group came back under another nomenclature and different recruiting norms. So it, that's another story. But uh, what happened is that uh, uh, very, very quickly, uh, this blew up literally in the face of the government because you had thousands of people, tribal people, and this is the target group for both the state and the rebels who were quarreled into literally into concentration camps. Meaning, I've been there, I've seen this with my own eyes. They used a horrific quarreling slums in some towns where people were crammed in essentially not for development or to save them it was essentially to deny the maoists their recruiting base and to deny maoists their supporting base so they were literally at the 1.50000 people were living in concentration camps in chhattisgarh so many many bad things came out of it uh, uh, paramilitary forces and police forces from other states like nagaland were sent into uh, in Chhattisgarh and the Naga, uh, the troops, many, it's, I'm on the record saying this because there's proof, and I haven't been sued all these years. I don't think I'm going to be sued now. Unfortunately, the, they were brought in and they literally ran riot. They were butchering not just the cattle, but also the people. So there were, there were horrific stories that came out of that. Now, what began to happen is that when this got exposed, when the Supreme Court stepped in, when there was mitigating mitigation that began to take place as it should in a democratic country or a seemingly democratic country, 
then the development parameters stepped in, which right. is basically derived from the National Advisory Council. And the nodal ministries for that were not just the Home Ministry, but very, very significantly, the Rural Development Ministry. And that they began to they, they began to blueprint and try out and experiment with something that they called IDP, the Integrated Development Plan, where they would take on uh, the, the like the Saranda Forest in Orissa, and which borders Saranda and Bihar Jharkhand. So there was a Saranda Development Plan, which became part of this thing. There was a Saruyu Development Plan that came. And, and these two things that you speak about, police reform and yeah. development, eventually leads to the. Uh, the, the 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 controlling of the situation to now where just about last week or two weeks back uh, the ministry of home affairs has said that there's been a uh, you know containment of of the of the movement to just a couple of districts and you know violence has come down but we'll come to that i'm very curious to talk about your own travels during this book because you as you traveled through this entire area this was an area where there was a lot of violence even while you were traveling you went to the interiors to the camps, as you said, you've seen all sides of this. Give me a journalist's take on what you saw and what it was like. Because you know what is amazing is all of us, as as business journalists or, or, or journalists in the mainstream, are, are so focused on the Delhi's and the Bombay's. And you know, uh, I like the way you talk, you juxtapose your trip to Davos with with the World Economic Forum and and the work over here. It must have been a, a huge, huge learning curve. I can quite imagine it, but tell us what, what it was like. When I went to this thing, this is basically many what drove me to do the kind of work that I now do, is that I saw while I was being in mainstream media from top right up to the bottom, and I left mainstream media at the top of my game to become an independent research and writer precisely to address these issues because I saw that it was very, very necessary to talk about stories that needed to be talked about, stories that needed to be shared more, that this disconnect, that this huge disconnect that in India had within itself, this fracture within India, uh, this sort of denial of our issues or problems or rights and wrongs within India had to be brought forth into the boardrooms, drawing rooms, living rooms, policymaking rooms, and of, of, of India. That this, this disconnect had to be made mainstream. So that is what began to drive my own work, which is what drove me to do Red Sun in the first place, and has driven me to do related work. And all my nonfiction writing since uh, the mid 2000s has been predicated on delivering precisely this message to, to make people understand why the disconnect exists so that the, the disconnectedness becomes connectedness. There is a acknowledgement understanding of why these root causes remain, why India needs to move together, and why development and aspiration needs to be integrated and needs to be acknowledged and we move forward together. It seems idealistic, but we are still paying the price meaning of that uh, the lack of acknowledgement of that because we, as you said, we're in 2022, 55th year of the Maoist rebellion, which began in Naxalbari in May 20, uh, 19, 1957, 55 years later, it still covers an area of uh, India that is the size of two and a half or three Bangladesh. It's not a small, it's not a shabby sum. It is no longer one third of India, but it is still a vast geography uh, across Jharkhand, across uh, Mahara, parts of Maharashtra, across Orissa, parts of Andhra. And it is, I'm told, creeping back into areas like West Bengal. Elements of it exist in the tri junction area of Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, and Kerala. Why? There must be something critically wrong, Mini, in the way we govern ourselves. India is a hugely wealthy nation. India is a hugely powerful country. Why then does this exist 55 years into that area in an unbroken string? There must surely be something that we're doing wrong. And that's why this integrated development project, I mean, unfortunately, we pay attention to these things when violence happens. There is a phrase in conflict management or conflict resolution, which is called privileging violence. And it has been shared by me by... Ajay Sani, who runs uh, who's a fine analyst and commentator, who runs the Institute of Conflict Management in Delhi. I have great respect for Ajay. Uh, and this is something Ajay spoke to me about when I was actually interviewing him for Red Sun many, many years ago. 
And uh, I, I love what he said. He said, that, Sudeep, you know, it's all about privileging violence. We never learn. And I said, Ajay, you know, it sounds lovely. Tell me more about it. He says, Sudeep, it's very simple. That, you know, unless you pick up a weapon, unless you get so angry that you explode in your anger uh, because you're not getting justice, you're not, you're, your dignity is being robbed, you're not getting your opportunities, you're just being trodden on day after day after day, decade after decade, unless you scream and shout, unless you pick up violence as a, as a mode of protest, not as, a, not, as a, not as an end, but as a means, the state does not listen to you. So ironically, only when people have taken to this extreme violence has the government, has the state stepped in and said, okay, uh, send in healthcare, send in primary education, send in the block development officer, send in this, send in that. Why the hell did you do it in the first place? Why did you deny? Because you didn't, these regions didn't deliver the political bang for the buck. These are demographically sparse regions, right? And therefore, I think the system just said, let it be. You know, these are the places, vast tracts of India fell in between the cracks. And only when violence came to the fore in these regions, did the state wake up and said, oh, bloody hell, uh, why are they rebelling? Hello, because you didn't deliver what you promised them or what government after government has promised them. So you now know, the government, sorry, yeah. go ahead. You know, when I was reading your book, you know, uh, I, I could feel the enormity of the crisis at that point, because at that point, most of the voices were despondent. They were frustrated. They were desperate. They were talking about uh, 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 the movement going far beyond the 200 districts. You were yes. talking about sleeper cells in urban centers. You were talking about sympathizers yes. uh, among uh, the, the white collared people who were sympathizing yes. with. Yes. Uh, how has it changed since then? Because, you know, from the statistics, we know that the development has worked, that there has been movement, but there are still cases of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of violence and conflict that we keep hearing of. Not as much as it was. I think 2010 also kind of was at a high, but it has kind of uh, taken a back. What was your assessment of it? There, there are several reasons for this, many, and all are equally important. One is this is a huge state pushback against the rebellion. So there was, a, uh, we talked about, which is why I set it up by talking about this policing coordination, greater sharing of intelligence, uh, greater coordination between uh, central paramilitary forces like CRPF and others, and then uh, people getting into uh, uh, better coordination with the state police forces, better training, more weaponry, upgrading and modernization of the police stations, for instance, uh, all sort of this happened in one way. There was this huge, huge pushback uh, that happened from the government point of view, massive deployment in tens of thousands of police and paramilitary which went into these mouse areas to essentially do what is in security parlance called area domination, right? The Maoists had it before, the, the, the security forces went and went, and, went ahead to reclaim those areas, which is what takes me back to that earlier phrase I used, clear, hold, build, to, to you know, clear the area of the rebels, hold that area, and then build on it, i.e. with services with development, with facilities, which the Maoists uh, had, had claimed for themselves by setting up their own parallel governments. So that is one thing that happened, huge, enormous pushback. So there was a rate of, there was a, there was a system of attrition where you have this enorm, enormous power and numerical strength of the Indian state that was played against the Maoist forces. And even at their peak, the Maoists were at 20,000 strong, with say 40,000 sympathizers, which is huge. Uh, or, and then lower to 10 and now lower to five. And now core figures are spoken of in terms of two and 3,000, right? But in a, in, if you speak to any conflict expert, or even the policeman or the army person, they'll tell you that in, in Kashmir, they claim that there are 300 to 350 militants. And that has got, I don't know how many divisions of the Indian army in Kashmir and how many paramilitary battalions and divisions in, in Kashmir. Imagine what 2,000 can do. Imagine what 10,000 can do. So you see the, you know, it, it's in numbers beyond a point don't really reflect the, the truth. So there was a pushback, there was attrition, new, greater numerical strength, greater operational ability, greater know-how, uh, greater intelligence gathering, all kinds of things led to a lessening uh, through attrition, through killings, through operation, through arrests, it, numbers began to lessen. 
uh, in a way. There was another very key reason, which many states, uh, Jharkhand, Bihar, Andhra, Telangana, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, so on and so forth, started offering rehabilitation packages. So, you know, surrender, so-called surrender pack packages that rebels come in, surrender, they would get a sort of seed money to set themselves up and basically rehabilitate themselves back into the so-called mainstream, if you will. That began to happen. Then there was a key thing that happened that the older leadership within the Maoist party began to get old. They began to die off. The newer leadership began to come in. The intellectual firepower that the Maoist movement had actually devolved into the people they were fighting for. So the newer leaders in the Maoist rebellion are now tribal people, are now local people. So you know it, it sort of permeated to the people on whose behalf the rebellion was being fought. So there is that change. Now the third uh, and the other hugely important uh, uh, reasons are that development has kicked in to some extent, cynically perhaps, that roads are being made now to ensure that the policing is more effective. But ergo, roads are being made. It's happening for I, a cynical reason, but bottom line, roads are there. If the primary healthcare centers are going back for cynical reasons, ergo, the primary health centers exist. If development is going in, if M. Nariga and other development uh, initiatives and healthcare and primary education and right to work, etc., are being implemented, then good. Yes, they're being impl implemented cynically now in order to hold and then build upon these territorial rec reclamations that are happening. But at least it's happening. So there are good things. Other things that are happening, many are hugely important, which I think has helped uh, democratic India to a great extent. For instance, right to information, the right to information act. I think the right, to, and I've written about this, and I've spoken to people uh, that I know in the Maoist movement and extreme left or left of center spaces. That I said, look, guys, you know, uh, you have right to information. You, you know, th this whole tool about you holding people accountable for their ills can now be done by citizens like you and me. Anybody can do right to information. Then. Uh, accountability movements, electoral accountability movements have gone more robust. Of course, it doesn't look like that if you see the trajectory in the last eight to nine years, because in, in India has also become very, very unitary and very, very strong arm because of the political dispensation and power. But the fact is that the mechanics for accountability that a citizen can ask of the state or hold people to hold people in power to accountability, like journalists are supposed to hold truth to speak truth to power, citizens can speak accountability to power. So that has also evolved. So a multiplicity of reasons uh, uh, many have contributed to a compacting of the rebellion by the numbers to be lessened and the geography to be hugely lessened from say one third of the geographical spread of India to essentially what I described as two Bangladeshis. Uh, or two and a half. But nevertheless, you know, and, and that brings me to the last question, Sudeep, uh, to where we started from, really. For 55 years, it's festered. And the sad thing is that I think attention has moved out of here, you know, especially with mainstream media not interested. It's only when there is a crisis that, uh, you know, uh, or, or a, a violent conflict that, that it comes back into the news. But the fact is, inequity has also kind of spread. So, I mean, the cynical view, if, if I was to take a cynical view, it is, we've not seen the last of it. It is not a long it. way off. It's a long not way it. off. And, you know, it really needs a lot of introspection to see why on the 75th year of India's independence, there has been this festering crisis for 55 years uh, through it. I mean, it, it's a sobering thought, isn't it? Indeed it is, Mini, and I'm very glad we're discussing this openly and without fear or favor, because we must be addressing these issues. Because you know, inequity has actually grown. In fact, uh, coincidentally, when COVID happened, I actually made a presentation to a couple of security think tanks, saying that, look, guys, you know, there's this already huge pool of negative energy. You've got these rebellions off the map, from off your mental map. They haven't gone away. They've just diminished, and you just shrug them aside for for now. But look at the pools of negative energy that exist today. Uh, COVID has hugely impacted the Indian economy. Joblessness is huge, even though there'll be, you know, sort of pamphleteering about how everything is rosy and all right. Let me assure you that people who deal with security matters 
and people who deal with these uh, situations and in the in the risk analysis business like in the, the space that I inhabit, for instance, and definitely the rebels themselves, and definitely the people at the bottom of the pyramid, the socioeconomic pyramid, the tribal people, the displaced people, the jobless, the urban poor, the rural poor, the farmers who are looking at inflation, uh, and in many cases, hyperinflationary uh, situations. This is the negative energy. Like, for instance, in 2003, 4, and 5, when it exploded out of seemingly out of nowhere, of this what what I call Mark Four and Mark Five stage of the Maoist rebellion, and we are I think going into Mark Six. Uh, we don't have time to discuss this maybe another day. Uh, but when that exploded out seemingly out of nowhere, uh, it the party the, the high growth party of India suddenly woke up and said, "Hello, where did this come from, my friends? It was already there, and therefore, my friends, it exists to this day. So wake up and smell the rebellion." smell the inequity and smell the non-governance and mixed governance and smell the non-delivery of criminal justice that continues to this day. Wake up and smell the inequity. I'm, I'm not speaking as a communist. I'm not a communist. I'm a, quite a patent capitalist little pig. But please let us all collectively wake up and smell the objective conditions for rebellion that continue to exist to this day. That is what we must recognize, acknowledge, and only that then puts in context. Is that also puts in context the deflection of public opinion towards um, you know uh, nonsensical debates, the Indeed. the masha that we see on television, and and sometimes it's it's nice to uh, you know uh, just go back to the basics and the roots of uh, everything. And I really admire the work that you've done, Sudeep, Thank of you. going Thank back you. and and really uh, you know. Um, being the journalist that you are and, and uh, reporting as is, I think it's that's what India needs much more of. So congratulations on that. And many thanks for this uh, conversation full of insights. And I hope that, you know, our viewers take away a lot from this because this is definitely not the end of the story, but really a time for reflection. Thank you. Many thanks. <laughs>